today I get to finish up on some of the hardest chapters in Romans. <laughs> if you haven't noticed yet, chapters 9 through 11 have been somewhat difficult to understand, somewhat difficult to teach and to, and to preach because they deal with Israel. They deal with the nationality, ethnic Israel, the peoples of Israel. I said before and I say it again, the church is not Israel. We are a mystery. We are something different, totally different. We weren't even spoken about in the Old Testament, but Gentiles were spoken about by Isaiah and Zechariah, talking about them coming into the kingdom, coming into with the Jews, worshiping God, but they didn't know what to call it. They didn't know what it was. And the church was a hidden mystery. It wasn't kept from people in order to keep them from understanding. It was kept so that when it is revealed, it will be glorious. And that's, as, that's where we are. You may not feel very glorious this morning, but you are glorious in the sight of God because Christ Jesus, his son, died so that we could be here today, so that we could be alive, we could be moving about and, and teaching the gospel and living the life of the Holy Spirit in us and through us. And everything that we do today is because of what he did thousands of years ago through Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament knew it was coming. They just didn't know what it was. And so here we see the wrap-up of chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 25. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> verse 25. It said, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on the account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irre irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so too they have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. That's a mouthful right there, but I'll help you out with it in a minute. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on all of them. Oh, the depth and the riches of wisdom of the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. As I said, Paul is wrapping this up with the Roman church. He's wrapping this up and saying, look, folks, we are not to, we Gentiles who've been brought into the church, we Gentiles who believe, we Romans or wherever he's at here in Rome, you guys have been added to the church by the grace of God. And basically what he's saying in the wrap-up here is don't get prideful. Don't get conceited thinking you're better than a Jew. Don't do that, he's saying. Because you are not for from them, from the root is where you get all your sustenance in the first place. We go back to last week's message where he says, you know, you're grafted in, but don't be proud of being grafted in for those that are broken off, thinking you're better than they are. You're grafted in because of the patriot, because of God's mercy and grace. And the root of what it was coming from that olive tree, that's, that stump, if you will, that, that vine, the root, is, is what our supplement is. Basically everything from the patriarchs up to us. Now it doesn't mean we've taken over for Israel. It doesn't mean we have now taken Israel's place and God just done away with them. No, no, no. There's a, there's a number of verses in New and Old Testament that talk about Israel being restored. Israel, the ethnic Jew, the nation Israel will be restored. I believe that's going to happen when Christ comes back at his second coming. All, as you see the verse in there, it said all Israel will be saved. You need to understand something. That doesn't mean that every single one of them is going to receive Christ. All right? Even at that point, when that word all, and I know you're trying, you don't want to split words up here and all, but if you go back to the Old Testament and you see that word all used a number of times, all Israel was there at the stoning of such and such. All the, does that mean all 100 million of them were in one spot? No. It meant the majority. It meant the ones who represented Israel, that remnant, if you will, means all Israel was there. So when Christ comes back, all Israel getting saved means all those who will believe on him. And trust me, when he says there, he will wipe away the sins of Jacob, he will open their eyes. When Christ comes back the second time, sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, you remember that, the story there, what's going to happen? He's going to set his foot down. Israel will look at him and they will say, that's our king. 
That's our Messiah. We accept him now. Many, 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 not all of them, not all of them, but many of them will receive him because he's coming back the way they wanted him the first time. King of kings and Lord of lords, wielding a shield and a sword. He's, he's coming back and taking care of business on that second tr trip. Amen, church? Now, we've got to understand something. We, we're already with him. We're already really, I, I'm a firm believer in the resurrection. The Bible hints at it, points at it, shoots, shoots darts at it. It's, it's there, and I believe that's going to take place before Jesus sets his foot down upon this earth, that he will come and we will meet him in the air. He's calling us forth, and he's going to receive his harvest of his church. He's going he's to come, he's going to stop midway, if you will, or in the clouds. He told the guys that the same way I left, I'm coming back. Well, to receive his church, which is a mystery of what God is doing, been revealed and unveiled to this first generation of Christians, to receive his church, he's going to stop. He's not coming all the way down. He's going to say, come forth. And the dead in Christ are going to do what? Rise first, right? And then we who are left behind will what? Be caught up to meet him in the air. Caught up to meet him in the air. And so will we be with the Lord forever. Amen, sir? But when he comes back his second time and puts his foot back on the dirt... Puts his foot back up on this earth. We're, we're already with him. We're already gone. We've already been, res we, we, we've been redeemed. We've been resurrected. We've been everything. We've been lifted, if you will, off the face of the earth. So this second coming here that this is talking about, Isaiah, Zechariah talks about it. It says when he comes from, from Zion. Notice Paul says he comes from Zion. He's coming from Zion. They, they consider heaven. They consider where he is now, Zion, with God, and to Zion in Israel. He says he's going to come from Zion. He's talking about it as a hint toward the second coming is what he's talking about. The Bible calls it the parousia, uh, the second coming of Christ. When he comes back with his armies, when he comes back to set up the nation, ethnic Israel, where they were before with God. But when he comes back, he says he's going to wipe away their sin. It's a, it's a phenomenal thing what's going to take place. But it's not a second salvation. Get me, don't get me wrong. It's not going to be a second salvation or a different way of salvation for them. They still have to believe that he is the Son of God and that he is Messiah. It still will deal with faith and belief just like it does with us right now. But when they see him come, their faith's going to get excited. Amen, church? <laughs> their faith's going to get excited. I think, as a matter of fact, uh, when the church is, is taken out, that many of the Jews are going to get pretty excited right then going, wait, whoa, what happened? to all these millions of Christians that used to be here. It's going to wake their eyes. It's going to open some of their eyes a little bit, isn't it? But notice that it's interesting here. In that very first verse, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers. He said, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. Notice it says in part there. Until the full number of us boys has come in. Us boys being the Gentiles. Now, what is that number? We don't know. That's a mystery too, and it's kind of hidden from us as to how many Gentiles God will allow into the kingdom before he says, enough, go get them, my son. And, and Gentiles being the church. Not all of us are Gentiles, though, are we, church? There is an in-part blinding, there's an in-part hardening of the Jewish nation, of the ethnic Jews. Is there not Jewish people being saved today? Giving their life to Jesus, we call them Messianic Jews. They're giving their life to Jesus Christ. Why are they doing that? Because they have had their eyes open. They see that Jesus is Messiah and the moment that, he is, that they see that, the hardening is taken away. The blindness, is taken, if you will, is taken away. Matter of fact, the scripture says that even to this very day, when they read the law of Moses, their heart is blinded. Their eyes are blinded to the truth of what Jesus is. And God has, has allowed that. God has said, I'll just leave them in that. That they, they follow the law of Moses. They don't believe in my Christ. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in my Messiah. I'm going to leave them right there in that. So when they read the law of Moses, they're still blinded. They're still in that law. But when he says, I come back, he says, I'm going to open all their eyes. I'm going to see, they're going to all see who Jesus really is. And the moment they see and believe, then the blindness is taken away. Isn't that interesting? I once was blind, but what? Now I see. We Baptists sing that all the time. We don't realize what we're singing, do. Before you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were blind to what the Scripture said to him. Amen? Who opened your eyes? You? God did. God said, I'll reveal myself to you. God said, that's why salvation is totally dependent upon God to open your eyes and then you to say yes. Then it becomes your part. Until your eyes are open, until you see God, until he allows you to see the truth. And trust me, folks, he allows everyone a chance to see the truth. God said, I, I didn't condemn this. So I'm not sending anybody to hell just to be, you know, for, for kicks. 
People go to hell. People reject me because they've seen salvation and they reject it. The Jews of this day and time, they saw salvation. His name was Jesus and they rejected him. And they killed him. They put him on a cross. Kill him. Get rid of him. He's messing up our church activities. Just get rid of him. And they saw salvation. The minute God opens your eyes by the power of the Holy Spirit, and, you know, you've probably gone to church. You remember your salvation day. You probably went to church all your life. Sat there and threw many an invitation and finally went, oh, I get it. And you're thinking, how do I just now get it? I've been in Sunday school for 20 years studying it, but I just now get it because God opened your eyes to it. And that's the part also of our life, Christian, after we get our eyes open, after we receive Christ as our Savior, God begins to peel away things. You start seeing more and more, don't you? Now you start reading that scripture, and it's like, this is no ordinary book, is it? No, it's not an ordinary book. I'm getting more. This is not Charles Dickens here, baby. This is, this is some serious stuff in this book called the Bible. It comes alive on you, doesn't it? It comes alive on you with the power of the Holy Spirit through you. So he's trying to tell us here. He's telling us. He's not trying to. In the first verse here, he says, They are hardened in part. Israel has been hardened. God has put them in that hardening. Let them stay in that hardening. Isn't it interesting that that goes right along with the verse that God turned them over to a reprobate mind? Remember we read about that not long ago? He finally just kind of gave up on them and said, Okay, I'll let you live in your sin until sin does its full tear up of your life. And then maybe you'll come repent, and I'll rescue you out of it. But God gives them over. God gives them over. So he gave them over to a hardening here in part. So some Jews are still coming in. Until the full number of us Gentiles has come in. We're still there. Amen, church? We call it the age of grace, the age of the church. God has not said, that's enough, come home. When he says, that's enough, come home, then he will reset Israel the way Israel is going to be set. I'm not sure what it's going to look like exactly. All I know is that God's going to turn them around. Amen? He's going to open their eyes. They're going to repent. And they're going to receive Jesus Christ. It's going to be a worldwide awakening at that point, if you will, in that millennial reign because Israel, all Israel, most of the majority of Israel will be saved. That doesn't mean every single one of them. When he let us Gentiles into the church, when he let us into his kingdom, does that mean every single Gentile is getting saved? No, we can attest to that. Amen? America ought to be proof of that, that all Gentiles do not get saved. All Gentiles will not receive Jesus Christ. Just look at the way this country's going. And you'll see that we're not following after the statute and the, and the work of Jesus Christ. We're following after something else, but not God. I worry about it sometimes even in our churches. Are we following after God or our own needs, our own desires, or God's way, or God's desire in our life? It's, it's, a, it's a tricky little situation, but I can guarantee you not all Gentiles are getting saved either. And he says, of course, as I mentioned, he says, All Israel, in 26, shall be saved. As it's written, the deliverer will come from Zion heaven if you will he'll turn godless away from jacob jacob's another name for israel remember that he said jacob you'll be called israel from here on he broke his hip bone you remember that <laughs> when he wrestled with the angel he broke it and then jacob the man jacob became known as israel and from him the descendants kept coming by the 12 tribes but he says i'll turn godlessness away from jacob god's doing this man's not doing this god's doing this with israel he's doing a supernatural thing with and verse 27 said this is my covenant with him when I take away their sin, that is the covenant already spoken to them. It's going to happen. As I said before, there's many, many things in this Bible here that have happened. Many prophecies have already happened. A few of them are coming up soon, and a lot more are coming in the future. Every one that has happened has happened 100% exactly the way it said it was going to do it. Trust me, the ones that has not happened are going to happen 100% exactly the way God said he's going to do it. We just don't know when. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So he's trying to make sure, and Paul's trying to make sure, look, understand this, folks. His covenant is going to happen with those folks. He will take away their sin, and they will be sent. They will be sin no more. They, in other words, they're going, to, they're going to convert to what Christ had come for in the first place. And look at verse 28. This is a little tricky here at first, but not too much. As far as the gospel is concerned, it says, they're enemies on your account. Who are they? Israel. Israel is enemies on our account. Enemies of who? Us? God. God says everybody that does not believe is considered his enemy. Now think about that. Everybody that does not believe, why is Israel set aside right now? Why is the nation of Israel, why are the people, ethnic Israel, set aside? Unbelief. Unbelief. It wasn't just because they killed, they, they crucified Christ. And we know that they did the part of crucifying, but it was for our benefit too. Remember that, church. It was our sins too that put him on the cross. Not just, don't get anti-Semitism going on here. It's not just the Jews who are the problem. 
We're the problem. That's why he had to go to the cross, too. We were the problem. Rome was the problem. Italy was the problem. Germany was the problem. All the nations of the world were the problem. We all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all hung him on that tree. Don't ever say, that Jewish bunch did it. No, that's not it. We did it. We did it. It was all about all of us, so don't go there with that. But understand that they're enemies on our account, enemies with God because of unbelief. But as far as election is concerned, they're loved on the account of the patriarchs. What that means is God's covenant with Abraham is still in effect. <laughs> it may be put on hold, but it's still in effect. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. What he promised Abraham and all of his descendants is going to happen. His bloodline, to his flesh descendant. We are his spiritual descendants. Remember that, church. We're, we're the spiritual descendants of Abraham. We're the ones who believe like Abraham did by faith, and that faith is our salvation, believing in Jesus Christ. Abraham believed God by faith, did exactly what God said, believed his word, and God counted it to him as righteousness. We believe in what God said and who Jesus Christ is, and Jesus gives us his righteousness, not our own. Our righteousness is not accounted for nothing but filthy rags. It's Jesus in us that counts for our righteousness. Remember that, church. We've already got it paid for in full by the man, Jesus Christ. Nothing we do. Therefore, we can't do what? We can't earn salvation or earn God's favor, can we? It's all about Jesus. It's all about... See, God set it up easy for us, folks. <laughs> you need to understand that. We got it easy. All we have to do is believe. Believe, and you will be saved. Believe. And salvation is yours. Believe in who he is. And verse 29, God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Irrevocable. What is salvation to us? The what? Gift of God, right? Now, if there's anybody in this room who thinks, I can be saved today and lost tomorrow, look at that verse again. God's gifts are irrevocable. In other words, you're not good enough to get it, and you're not bad enough to lose it. Think about that. His gifts are irrevocable. All kinds of gifts. Think of the gifts he gives the church today. Not just salvation, but all the other gifts. People have gift of singing, gift of prophecy, gifts of all, all this kind of stuff, music. And, and I think there's many people in this world, in America especially, that God has gifted them with a gift that they were supposed to be using for him, and they're out there using it for themselves and making millions off of it. I can't, I can't help but think of all the musicians out there that are in the world music industry that probably God gifted for them to use for his benefit, and they've taken that gift and went out there and did whatever they want to it. And it's irrevocable. God says, I gave it to you. You can misuse it if you want to for your own pleasure, but it's yours. It's yours. I will not take it back. That's the way I look at verse 29. I look at God doing that with us as human individuals. I look at it as, as, as far as salvation goes. It's a gift of God. For by grace you're saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's free, so no one can boast, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. So nobody can boast. He gives it to us a free gift. And so when his gift is irrevocable, that means I didn't earn it, and I can't really lose it. It's all in God's hand. He's the giver of that gift. So his gifts and call are irrevocable, not only for us in the church age today, but also for Israel, ethnic Israel, the Jews. The gifts and the, and the calling and the covenants that he gave them, he is not pulling them back and saying, y'all been bad, I'm taking it away from you. God is not that kind of giver, is he? He's not going to give you something and yank it back. He's a different type father than probably what we had upon the earth uh, that, that would give us something and, and say, I'm going to take it away from you to punish you with it. You know, no, God doesn't do that. He doesn't take it away to punish you. He gives it to you, and if you misuse it, you'll be held accountable for it one day. Amen? That's the way God works this stuff. He didn't bring it back. He didn't take it away from us, so it's irrevocable. He says in thir verse 30, he said, Look, guys, just as you... Uh, who were at one time disobedient, talking to the Gentiles, disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, the Jewish nation. So too they now have become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Notice what he did. God has bound all men over, in verse 32, disobedience so that he may have mercy on all of them. You know what that's saying? Israel has to approach God the same way we do. That they have the same mercy given to their boat. We're all in the same boat, in other words, what he's done. He has basically turned Israel over to their disobedience and us in our disobedience. He showed mercy to us Gentiles by allowing us into the kingdom in the thing called the church, he, by allowing us in. He has opened the door, swung wide open the door of salvation to the Gentile. And they, all who will believe, all of you, come on in. 
But not only that, he's looked at the, Israel, at the nation of Israel also and said, you know what, because of your disobedience, now the only way you can come in is I've got to show mercy to you. It has nothing to do with your bloodline. Nothing to do with who your uncle and your aunt and your monkey or whatever. It, it, you, you're coming in the same way, the same way as the Gentiles. My mercy, my grace, your belief. He leveled the playing field with us, didn't he, church? Because before, as Paul said in a few sermons ago, he said Israel had all the law, they had all of God, they had all the knowledge, they had all of this, and they kept it to themselves instead of sharing it with the Gentile nations and drawing them into the kingdom of God. So God took it from them and gave it to who? Us. It's the church age. He's given it to us. What are we supposed to do? What, what are some of the things that God has given to us that we should be taking care of right now? Well, we've got to flip a few notes here and find it here. Yeah. Here it is, Israel. Let's look at the fourfold mission of what they were chosen. Number one, to witness to the unity of God in the midst of universal idolatry. Out there with the Gentiles. Witness about God in the idolatry. Now think of this. Go all the way back to that original verse there in all the way original Israel. Number two, to illustrate to the nations the blessings of serving a true God. Illustrate to everybody what serving God was all about. Third thing, to receive, preserve, and transmit the scriptures. Get them out there. Fourth thing, to be the human channel for the Messiah. That's what Israel's calling was. That's where they failed. Does that sound like the same thing God's laid on the church? Think about it now. What, what does God want the church to do? Fourfold, witness about the unity of God and his mission in this world. Tell the gospel story. Witnesses, yeah. Second thing, what does the church do? Illustrate to the nations, to the lost, the blessedness of serving the true God. Now, we in America have opened our doors to all kinds of religions, and we have just been put on the shelf, Christianity on the shelf, with Muslims and the Krishnas and all the, all the other stuff as being just oh, another way to get to God. And we have seem to have just kind of kept our mouth shut and not told them, no, there's only one way to God through Jesus Christ. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. I can tell you right now, Muhammad and I... And, Aliism, they're not producing, promoting Jesus as the only way. Krishnas are not promoting Jesus. Buddhism is not promoting Jesus the only way. So they, they, if, if their way is the way, and we've got all these different ways, then why are we even meeting? What's the point of Jesus? You understand that, right? So there's the church, another thing, to be the blessedness and service. To receive, preserve, and transmit the scriptures. We've got the scriptures all in one book now, don't we? We neatly combine them all together. Since we come up with the printing press, we got it all, and everybody's got seven or eight of them in their home. We got plenty of Bibles, don't we, church? All kinds of versions, all kinds of whatever, and, and some of them we probably hadn't looked at in 10 years. They got dust on them because we don't even read that version anymore or whatever. But we got the Bible. We got the Scripture. Preserve them. Not only preserve them, but to get them out there. Preserve them and transmit the Scriptures. Transmit them out by the way we live and the way we talk. The Scripture out into the people. And to be the human channel for the Messiah. What do we do every day? We say, Holy Spirit, fill us and use us. For what? To be the channel, to do the work of the Messiah. We are the body of Christ, right? So literally everything that Israel was commanded to do before Christ came, the church has been commanded with the same thing. Go you therefore and tell all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go do this. Go be my witnesses. Acts 1.8, you shall be witnesses to the end of the earth. Go do that. And he's saying, you know, church, also handle the scripture right. Tell them about the word of God. Live the word of God. Don't only just talk about it. Live it. Show it to them. So the same thing that Israel had there, we have given to us. And God has bound all men over to disobedience. Have, have mercy on all of us. And he does have mercy on us, doesn't he, church? I mean, think about what you really deserve <laughs> in your life today. What you really deserve and how God has shown love and mercy and grace to you. The more mess you become, the more grace he gives you. That don't mean go out and make more of a mess of it. Don't get me wrong there. Just so you can get more great. But it's there. It's available. No matter what you trip over, no matter what you fall over, no matter what sin you fall into, God's grace is available and there to help pull you back out. Amen? It's there for you. There's nothing that you can do or have done that His grace cannot overcome. His grace and His mercy to us. His mercy. We deserve death. There's no doubt about it. But His mercy says life. We deserve this. We deserve that when we fail. But his mercy says forgiven. Forgiven. Remember, everything that Jesus paid for on that cross that day paid for the sins of the past 
the sins of the present day of the cross and the sins future of the cross. It paid for us too, didn't it? 2,015 years later, what he did on that cross, 2,000 some odd years later, what he did paid for me and you. Paid for all of us. Paid for the sins that we fall into. Paid for the sins we commit intentionally. Paid for the sins that we didn't even realize we were committing. All taken care of by Jesus. And God just says, keep confessing that to me so I can set you free. I can set you free. That's why we confess. It's all for us, isn't it, church? God already knows what we're doing. It's for us so that we can find freedom. We can have freedom. And then he goes into a few verses here. I can, my Bible has it labeled doxology. After you come out of a theology, you've got to go into a praise time. You've got to go into a doxology, if you will. You go into to who God is and what he's all about. So look what he says here in 33. The depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, he's un, how unsearchable his judgment and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? I love that one right there. Who can tell God what to do? Amen. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? There's a good verse right there about your salvation. Nobody, God owes nobody anything. We do not earn it. We do not. He gives it as a gift. And then verse 36 gives it all in perspective here. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Where was Jesus Christ when the world was created? He was there creating it, wasn't he? Where was God? He was there creating it. Where was God in all this stuff that happened even before Genesis? He was right there creating. He was there making it. He was making it. So all things created, all things upon the, uh, upon the earth are his, belong to him, and are, are, are basically, uh, it says, are all things to him. In other words, it's all his. <laughs> That's why when I look in my wallet and say, this is my money. No, it's really God's, isn't it? I look at my house. This is my house. Well, it's really Laurie's and God's. But anyway, it's, yeah, you know what I'm saying, don't you, man? Yeah, I've got a little cave out in the back. Anyway, but uh, yeah, uh, all this stuff belongs. No, it doesn't. Everything that we get our fingertips on, everything we get our hands on belongs to him. We are his vessel, and it all belongs to him. And so I just think, I thank God that the Bible says, you know what, if you really want to go to the tithe thing, just give him 10%. Like God could have asked for 90, couldn't he? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So it's like, hey, the tithe is nothing because he already owns it all. He already owns it all. And as I said before, it's amazing how he makes 90% work a lot better than 100% when you don't give the 10%. You understand what I just said? It, write it up on the wall. Uh, yeah, yeah, the 90% goes a lot longer than the 100% you keep trying to make your bills get paid for if you just obey God. And give the way he says to give. He'll take care of that. Didn't mean to get off on a tithing message. But anyway, you understand that. It all belongs to him. Everything. All of us. Everything upon this earth. And then he finishes out. To him be glory forever. Amen. Now Paul's finishing it up saying, understand this, church. To him be glory forever whether you give it to him or not. Amen. To him be glory forever whether you give it to him or not. Amen. He's going to have glory. It's going to be his. It's inevitable that it works that way, and you can either join the party or stand off the side and go, I don't want to play. He's still going to get glory. Amen? Amen. He's still going to get the glory. So I say, hey, join the party. Join the party. Join the party that says, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Go ahead and do it now. Don't wait till you get there and have to bow by pressure. You do it right now in freedom and say, Jesus, you are Lord. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You're my Messiah. You're my Savior. You're my God. You confess that right now, freedom, folks. Freedom. No chains can hold that down. No ball and chain wrapped around the person that believes Jesus is Lord and confesses it here upon this earth and walks in it here upon this earth. So as, I, as you wrap up here what he's saying, I, I'm in doxology with Paul here saying, you know what, God's in control of it all, and no matter what happens, he will work it out. Whereas we don't sometimes see how it's going to work out. He'll work it out and make it work right. Even if it's something we fall into, even if it's a sin issue we fall into, he said, I will you will repent of that, I will lift you back up, and you will work it out. Work it out. You don't have to stay stuck in it. You can get up and roll out of it by repenting and moving on. That's all he's saying here. You can get up and move out of it. Just don't get prideful. Don't get conceited that God has shown favor to you in this time called the age of grace of church. Because Jews, the ethnic Jewish nation, he's going to rise up when God says now and, rise, and makes them rise up. And they're going to turn from their sin, turn from their ways, 
And as Paul said earlier in a couple of verses, a couple of sermons ago, that how much greater is this world going to be when they finally turn back to God if it's great right now with the Gentiles coming in? You think there's blessings now? Just wait. Just wait until they turn back to God and everything's made right and God pours his blessing out upon this, church, upon this earth like you wouldn't believe. And I believe that's going to happen in that millennial reign. We will already be with Christ. Amen, church? And we'll just be enjoying it all because we knew it was coming. The Bible said so, and we believed, and we followed it. Would you stand, please, with head bowed and eyes closed? All to Jesus, I surrender.